Hi, everyone. I, I see that everyone's starting to join in now. Uh, so we'll just get wait for a few minutes, give everybody a chance to get settled and join in. Um, I'm Tyler Stokes. I'm one of the International Services Specialists with International Student Scholar Services. And it looks like we have a full house today, so that's good. So in just a few moments, I'll introduce our presenter and we'll get going. Thanks everybody for coming in. So as we're uh, just waiting here for other people to join for a few minutes, I uh, just wanted to let you all know, um, so myself and my colleague Amy Bello, who is the Interim Director of International Student Scholars, who just joined us now. Hi, Amy. I was just uh, mentioning you. So uh, Amy and I will be sort of in the background while our um, our speaker, Lisa, is uh, going through the presentation. And if you'll notice on uh, your Zoom tab, there's several options. There's a chat feature, and then there's a Q&A tool. So if you would like to uh, post questions that you have as the presentation goes along, please put them and type them into the Q&A tool down there at the bottom of your screen. And then Amy and I will be monitoring that as we go through, and if we when Lisa gets to a, a, res a rev relevant section of the presentation, uh, we'll try and pass on a couple of relevant questions. And then we are going to have a half hour question and answer session at the end of the presentation. We'll be, we'll be able to pass on questions to Lisa to answer live. So if we don't get to it during the presentation, we'll try and make note of it to bring up at the end. Uh, so with all that being said, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, our speaker today, our presenter, so uh, she, her name is Lisa Batten, and she is the, she is the uh, partner of Batten Alpert LLP in Boulder, Colorado. She's a third generation Colorado native, and she's been licensed to practice law uh, since 1994. She works exclusively in immigration law, and she's an active member of the American Immigration Lawyers Association and has previously served as the chair of the Colorado chapter of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. She's also so served on the board of governors of AILA, AILA and is a member of the Family Immigration Committee. And she's also a past president of the Colorado Bar Association's immigration section. So we're really fortunate to have Lisa joining us today to present. She's most definitely an expert on immigration law and I think she's gonna give us some really great content today. So uh, Amy and I will step back now and let Lisa take over here. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tyler and Amy, for inviting me to speak. And nice to speak with everybody today. Uh, I hope the information that you'll receive will be useful to you. Um, we will certainly try to have time for questions, both between the sections where I'm speaking and then also at the end. Um, so with that, I think that we're, well, I, I should say that this is um, kind of a basic overview of the immigration options that would be available for most of you. Um, it's not meant to be an in-depth or super detailed explanation. Um, immigration law in the United States is extremely complicated and it is changing all the time which I'm sure um, is not a surprise to you since there are important changes that have happened under the Trump administration to the student uh, visa program and to the J-1 program to visa issuance abroad. Um, and then there are many, many changes to the employment-based immigration uh, system 
So I'm going to touch on some of those changes today, but it's not, it's really a, an ever-changing landscape. Um, some of the changes are going to be affected by federal litigation. Some are going to be affected if we have a new president um, after our election in November. Um, but the information that I'm going to give you today is basic, it's central um, to the processes that might be available to you. Um, but I think it's very important that you stay in very close contact um, with your excellent advisors um, at the International Student Office um, and that you, before taking any steps, really have a consultation um, both with them um, and if you, if you would like with an immigration attorney, whether it's myself or someone else. Um, and with that said, I'm going to jump in really to the basics of the H-1B visa program. So it's going to be um, a very common path for students that you use an F-1 visa to complete your degree program, um, that, that after your degree program, you apply for work authorization in the form of optional practical training. Um, if your degree is in the STEM field, you may be able to apply for a STEM extension of your optional practical training. Um, and then at some point in the process, you may want to pursue a work visa to the United States. And the basic most common work visa used by college graduates is the H-1B visa program. So the H-1B is a visa for someone who performs work in what the immigration system calls a specialty occupation. So a specialty occupation is usually an occupation which requires someone to have completed at least a bachelor's degree. So as a beneficiary of an H-1B petition, you must have completed the degree and the job offered to you must require that degree and the job the degree required by the job offered must be related or the same as the degree that you have um, this th these types of visas are requested or petitioned by a u.s employer so the u.s employer must complete certain steps both with the u.s department of labor and then with the immigration service called USCIS in order to ask for an H-1B for a particular um, prospective employee. Uh, the position offered by the employer could be full-time or it could be part-time or it could be a range of hours. If part-time or even if full-time, you could have more than one employer ask for an H-1B on your behalf. So it is possible to hold more than one H-1B at one time, and that's called concurrent H-1Bs. A very important part of the program, the H-1B program, is administered by the U.S. Department of Labor. So prior to filing an H-1B petition, the U.S. employer must file an application with the U.S. Department of Labor called a Labor Condition Application, or an LCA. As part of that LCA, the employer is certifying that they will offer the foreign national employee the same wages and working conditions that are offered to U.S. employees. As part of that labor condition application, the employer must certify that they are offering you at least the minimum salary which the law requires. And this part of the program is under uh, a lot of attack at this point, um, but a lot of change. So there was a proposed or a final regulation that the Trump administration has offered both through the Department of Labor and the USCIS. And this regulation will require employers to offer H-1B workers much higher wages than has been required in the past. If 
this rule will be final um, in January. Um, I anticipate that this rule will be challenged in the U.S. courts, and it's quite possible that the rule will be stopped or enjoined by a court, whether that's temporarily or permanently. But until a court injunction or court order is issued, this rule is part of the landscape currently. So as of uh, recently, H-1B employers must offer H-1B workers wages, which is much higher, which are much higher than have been issued in the past. Um, this is going to affect um, especially entry level H-1B workers. It's going to make the pro uh, program harder to use. Um, it's going to have certain restrictions that were not required in the past, especially over um, an employer placing an employee at another work site, which is very common, per particularly in the IT industry where these visas are commonly used. Um, so there are a lot of changes in this program, but we're, it does continue. It is a viable option for students, and it's something that you'll want to familiarize yourself with as you start looking for employers. It's very common that you might finish your degree, go to work for an employer under OPT or optional practical training. And then if you like the employer and they like you, then the employer would look at an H-1B petition on your behalf. Um, the H-1B program cannot be used for self-employment, so you cannot ask for an H-1B for yourself. You cannot start your own company in which you have a significant equity interest. Um, it does have to be uh, an employer that's different or separate from you that petitions for the H-1B visa. Um, if approved, H-1Bs are approved for a maximum of three years at any one time um, for a possible six-year maximum. Um, if you are outside the United States during any part of that six-year period, that time can be recaptured later by filing another petition. And extensions past six years are possible under certain circumstances if a permanent residence or green card application is started. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. It's very common that companies, if they, re if they receive an H-1B approval for an employee, would want you to work for a year or two or three, depending on the company, um, before starting a green card process on an employee's behalf. Um, similarly, I think that an employee needs to be comfortable with an employer um, before starting a green card process because that green card process will most likely keep you in that job for a few years. So you have to be comfortable that you're not going to be changing employers immediately after the green card process is started. Something that greatly affects your ability to use the H-1B program is whether your H-1B will be subject to the H-1B cap or exempt from the H-1B cap. So the H-1B cap is a limit on the number of H-1B petitions that may be approved in any one fiscal year. So the fiscal year for the government starts on October 1st and ends on September 30th. Starting October 1st of any one year, 20,000 H-1Bs are available to those have, who have completed a U.S. master's degree or U.S. PhD. In addition to those 20,000, there are 65,000 H-1Bs available for those who may have, um, well, anyone else, um, someone who has a bachelor's degree or someone who has a foreign degree, bachelor's, master's, or PhD. So all H-1B cap subject petitions start on October 1st of every year. We always, or the Immigration Service always receives more H-1B 
petitions than there are visas available. So there are 85,000 available in any one year. And in the past few years, more than 185,000 have been re requests have been received in any one year. So because more requests are received than visas available, the immigration chooses which ones to process and which ones to reject. That process of choosing is done by lottery. So it's a random lottery. Immigration looks at all that are avail available and randomly selects those which will be processed and those which will be rejected. Um, in the past, the lottery was done actually physically. So <laughs> 185 or 220,000 petitions were mailed to an immigration service center and the immigration service randomly selected those. It took several weeks for that to happen and rejected those which were not selected. But last year, immigration went to a different process and it was an online registration process. So an employer or a lawyer representing an employer had to go into an online system, enter some basic information about the company and about the beneficiary, the potential employee. And that entry was done between March 1st and March 20th. Um, the filing fee for that entry was only $10 per registration. And the amount of information required was fairly minimal. So it was not a, not a difficult process, not a cumbersome process. Um, an employer could only file one registration for every job opportunity. So employer A could only file for employee B one time. But there was no prohibition against having an employee, having multiple employers filing for one beneficiary. So if you had multiple job offers and multiple companies that would like to sponsor you for an H-1B, each of those companies could file a registration on your behalf. Last year, registrations were selected between March 20th and April 1st. Uh, the process worked amazingly well. Um, I have to say that uh, my cases sailed through without a lot of difficulty. Um, it was easy to register. Um, we needed some communication with the company to confirm the registration. That worked very well. Um, the selections were visible um, very quickly after they were completed and the information that we needed from that selection was easily available so that we could go forward and file petitions for um, our clients who were selected in the lottery. For clients that were selected in the lottery, they were able to file their petitions between April 1st and June 30th um, of 2020. Um, the process in June got very difficult because USCIS received many, many petitions in their mailroom in June, um, especially the last two or three weeks of June, um, many more than they had mailroom personnel available. Part of that was compounded by COVID and the difficulties of having personnel in their mailroom. Um, and part of it, I think, is that USCIS did not anticipate how many people were going to file at the end of the filing period. So for people who filed at the end of June, many of them waited two and three months to get their filings actually opened and entered into the system. So for my law firm, what we recommended was clients contact us no later than February 1st to start their registration process. Uh, we went through some basic review of the information to make sure that this was going to be an H-1B petition that we thought could succeed. So we reviewed salary information, we, received, we reviewed beneficiary qualifications, degrees, and transcripts, 
to make sure that the beneficiary had a degree that was related to the job offered. We reviewed job descriptions to make sure that the position was complex enough to be considered a specialty occupation for H-1B purposes and to make sure that there was a good match between the job description and the beneficiary's education. Um, so, you know, those kinds of things can take time. So as you are going through your period of OPT, as you are perhaps broaching the topic of H-1B petitions with your employer or your H-1B employer is talking to you about it, it's important that you keep these timing considerations in mind. Because if you miss registration, you cannot continue for that fiscal year if your employer is cap subject. Um, if you miss filing on time, you've missed your opportunity for that year. Um, so these filing considerations are critical to your process. Um, the exact specifics of how the 2022 uh, registration process will be handled have not been announced. Um, the process worked very well, I think, from a stakeholder standpoint as well as a government standpoint this year. So we hope that the process will be similar um, next year, but we don't know that. I would expect an announcement from the Immigration Service probably near uh, December or January about specific dates for registration. So you'll want to keep that in mind. Um, as you move forward. Now, not all employers are going to be subject to the H-1B cap. Some employers are specifically exempt from the H-1B cap, and that means that they can file an H-1B petition for an employee at any time in the year, and they are not going to be denied because a visa is unavailable for their employee. If they meet the criteria, their petition should be approved. So an employer is exempt from the cap if they're a university, a government research facility, or a nonprofit affiliated with university. <coughs> a nonprofit affiliated with the university requires a written affiliation agreement between the university and the nonprofit. And there are additional legal requirements basically that the mission of the nonprofit and the mission um, of the university are not exactly the same, but are similar. So I commonly file CAP exempt H 1B petitions, for example, for secondary school teachers. So because secondary schools may have students that attend classes at the university and because university students may participate in student teaching with the secondary school district, that is considered enough of an affiliation between the university and the secondary school district for the secondary school to be CAP exempt. Other examples of CAP exempt may be where um, the board of directors of a nonprofit um, are also university members. Um, it's great if you can fit into a cap exempt situation. It will make the process much easier um, and you won't be limited or have the potential of having your H-1B not considered in any one fiscal year. you can have any start date. So for example, um, if your OPT ends in, um, let's say, December, um, you could ask for an H-1B petition that started the day after your OPT expires if your employer is cap exempt. Um, we'll talk about a little bit more complications on OPT expiration relative to CAP subject employers in a minute. 
Um, there are other forms of H1Bs that are also CAP exempt, and those are called H1B1s. And they're limited to individuals who are either from Chile or from Singapore. So there's 1,400 CAP exempt H1B uh, uh, visas available to um, Chilean nationals and 5,400 to nationals of Singapore. We rarely, if ever, reach those limits, so they're pretty much available at any one time. Um, most of the H-1B requirements, including the labor condition application, will apply to H-1B-1 um, petitions. So it has to be a specialty occupation, has to be an employer, a U.S. employer that's different from the beneficiary. Um, the, the main difference, I think, in the H-1B-1 context is that the petition approval will be for one year at any one time. Um, but if you're a national from one of those countries, that's a super way to go. So it's certainly very common and very um, doable to change status from F1 to H1B. And you can do that as long as you are in valid F1 status at the time of filing your H1B petition. Um, if you have an, an, an issue with your underlying F1 status, that would need to be resolved before filing your H1B petition. Um, you can file your H-1B petition while you are within the grace period at the end of your F-1 status or your J-1 status. You don't have to be um, prior to that date. So you don't have to file, for example, prior to the expiration of your OPT, um, except that you may want to do that in order to take advantage of something that's called CAP GAP. Um, extensions of OPT. So if your OPT were to expire, for example, on June 1st, even though the H-1B rules would allow you to file your H-1B petition up to June 30th, because of your OPT expiration of June 1st, you would want to file your H-1B petition prior to June 1st. That would automatically, under the law, extend your OPT to September 30th of any one year. And, that, and it's important that your H-1B be, be approved on October 1st or before that date so that you don't have a gap between your OPT expiration and your H-1B beginning. But as long as you file your change of status from F1 to H1B before your F1 expires, you may remain in the United States while you wait for a decision. So you are not exactly in a status, but you are in a period that's authorized um, by the U.S. government. So if you leave the United States while your change of status is pending, while the, you are looking to change from F1 to H1B, if you leave the United States prior to the H1B approval, you will abandon your change of status from F1 to H1B. So during this period from Whenever you're chosen in the lottery and your employer files until your H-1B is approved, it's very important to discuss any proposed international travel, um, either with um, the International Student Office or with um, the lawyer that's representing you through this process. Um, if you leave, the Immigration Service can still approve the H-1B petition but it cannot approve the change of status from F1 to H1B. So you will have to make some decisions about either re-entering on F1, if that's still available to you, or waiting outside the United States until you're able to receive an H1B visa in your passport. 
and then enter, you may enter the U.S. up to 10 days before your H-1B begins. So if your H-1B begins on October 1st, you could enter the U.S. anytime after September 20th. You would be allowed to get settled between September 20th and October 1st and be ready to go to work on October 1st. Um, if you have an, a valid H-1B that's cap subject and you'd like to change jobs, another H-1B employer could file a petition on your behalf. And under, some, under a process that's called porting, as long as you are maintaining your H-1B status, as soon as your new employer files for you, you would be able to go to work for your new H-1B employer. You may make the decision that you want your new H-1B to be approved before you change employers, but you are allowed, if you do decide to do that, to port or change to your new em employer under certain conditions. If you were previously counted against the cap, the new petition is not <coughs> cap subject. So you don't have to ch only change employers on October 1st, for example, or be selected in the lottery again. Once you've been selected in the lottery and had an H-1B approved, you are not counted against the cap for um, the remainder of your six years in H-1B status. Um, there is a new provision in the law allowing, let's say that you unfortunately lose your H-1B uh, position, are laid off or lose it for some reason, um, for whatever reason, you are allowed to remain in the United States for up to 60 days and seek new H-1B employment. The new H-1B petition could be filed within 60 days of when your employment ends and you would still be able to remain in the United States and go to work uh, for your new um, employer as soon as their H1, as soon as the H-1B petition of the second employer is approved. Um, you're not eligible to work during that 60-day grace period. This is not technically a porting situation. A porting situation is where there's no gap in employment between um, the first employer and the second employer. Um, but this, this allowing the 60-day gap is um, really a nice feature in the law. Previously, I had to tell clients, well, really you need to leave the United States um, within 10 days of when your employment ends, which is not very generous and really very impractical um, if you are established here. Um, but the 60-day grace period is much more workable and that's available to you in any three-year period. You can take advantage of that grace period one time. So I think that's the end of what I wanted to cover with H-1B uh, petitions. Maybe this is a good time for us to take a little break. Um, Tyler or Amy, do you see any questions that people might have? Sure thing, yeah, we've collected a couple of them and I'll, I'll just ask them to you now. Great. Uh, the first one we've had was, how much higher pay does the employer have to offer to an H-1B employee? I think they're we're getting at a prevailing wage and things, Lisa. Yeah, that does sound like a prevailing wage question. So um, in the pet, there are wage surveys and they are published online and you are able to access that. Um, it's called OES wage data. It's published by the US Department of Labor. You can, uh, it's publicly available. You can go online, um, you can search in a particular location for a particular occupation. So you can search, for example, software engineer for Denver, Colorado. And you will see data come up for that, um, well, probably prior to October 8th, you would have seen data come up for that. Um, and it will list four different wage levels. There's level, level one, which is entry level, all the way up to level four, which is the most advanced. For most of, uh, for most students who are moving from OPT to an H-1B for the first time, most of those folks are gonna go into a level one wage. 
Although if you have a master's or a PhD, you may be moving into level two wages or higher. Under the new regulations which were published, wage data is not available if the top level wage is $200,000 or greater. I think it's $208,000 or greater, more than $100 an hour. Currently, wage data is not available. So for example, I was looking at wage data a few days ago for a financial manager in Los Angeles. Wage data is not available. Um, most software engineers in Silicon Valley, wage data is not available at this time, and that's because the Department of Labor is recalibrating all the wage data um, compared to what it was before. If wage data is not available, your employer does have the option of purchasing, or maybe they use, um, wage surveys which might be acceptable to the Department of Labor. So many of the larger um, wage surveys are going to be acceptable to the Department of Labor. Um, wage surveys, for example, published by Mercer are going to be acceptable. If your company, if your employer does not um, regularly um, purchase wage surveys, you do have the option of going to a few companies, and this will probably become more popular. Um, you can go to companies who specialize in selling wage surveys to H-1B employers. So we use, um, I've used these companies before. You can purchase a wage survey for a particular occupation if it's available for a particular location uh, for a few hundred dollars, which is much cheaper than subscribing to Mercer, for example, for an employer. So it could be much more acceptable. Um, I've read some statistics saying that under the new, under the new wage rules, Wages are going to have to increase for H-1B employees about 40% over what they were previously if you're going to use the OES or the Department of Labor's wage data. So using Mercer data or another wage survey is probably going to become a bigger part of the process than it was in the past. Um, so if an entry-level worker has to be paid 40% more in 2021 than they were paid in 2020. This is a big difference for many employers and it, you know, it, it, it's going to be, it's going to make a big difference. Um, I'm hopeful that that's not, that the wage, new wage rules will be enjoined and are not going to go into force, but if they are allowed um, to operate it, it's going to make a big difference in the H-1B program. Thank you, Lisa. Um, another one more question on H-1B before I'll let you move on. Uh, somebody asked, um, after H-1B status is revoked or withdrawn by the employer? After H-1B status is approved, can the petition be revoked? Is that the question? Yeah, can, it, can H-1B status be revoked or withdrawn by your H-1B employer? Yes. So um, if you, if your employment ends for any reason, whether you initiate that or whether the employer initiates um, the termination of your employer-employee relationship, then the employer is required by law to notify USCIS within 10 days that your employment relationship has ended. And at that point, USCIS will revoke or terminate the H-1B petition. In the past, revocation used to come very quickly after receiving notice um, from the employer. Um, more recently, you know, I, I usually see revocation happen, I would say, on average 30 to 60 days after we provide notice to USCIS. Um, but yeah, the employer is required to withdraw an H-1B or um, inform USCIS that the employee has left. In addition, the employer has to withdraw the labor condition application um, or the employer could potentially have liability under that labor condition application. So that should also be done. What this means as a practical matter, I think, for employees is that before leaving employment, if you're the one that's going to initiate, is that you be well prepared for what your next step is, whether your next step is that you're 
leaving the United States or you're looking for another job or you've secured another job, it's very important to consider all those steps very carefully. Because you're under, when you're in H-1B status, your underlying legal immigration status requires you to continue to work in the position that was described in the H-1B petition and under the conditions that were described in that petition. So you can't, for example, decide that you're gonna you know, have an H-1B approved for a location in Denver, Colorado, and then decide that you're gonna work remotely from La Jolla, California without properly preparing. Or you, know, you can't say, you know, I'm gonna just take a couple months off um, and then before I look for another job, you really have to plan all of those steps very carefully and determine how you're gonna maintain your legal immigration status during that period of time. I think you're muted, Tyler. I, I am muted, okay. sorry about that. Thanks so much for answering that. Um, I'll let you continue, thank you. Very good, and we can certainly circle back to more questions if they come up um, about H-1Bs when we get to the end. So another common visa um, is the J-1 visa. So J-1s are very wide ranging. I think in this context, you know, they're gonna be commonly used by foreign medical graduates, uh, postdocs, researchers, uh, scholars of various types. I think one really important, I'm not gonna really discuss the basics of what qualifies someone for a J-1 or the conditions of that visa type, but I think really one important um, condition of J-1 visa holders that you really have to consider carefully <coughs> is whether you're subject to 212E or the two-year homestay requirement. So some J-1 visa holders, certainly not all, but some are subject to 212E or the two-year homestay requirement. What this means is that before well, what it means is the, the goal of the program is that after someone com completes a J-1 program, they take the skills that they learned in context of the J-1 program and they return to their home country where they can apply those skills. Um, countries develop lists that are called skills lists and those skills lists are are, in, are developed in conjunction with the U.S. Department of State, and they are published on the U.S. Department of State website. So there'll be a skills list for almost every country. Some countries, for example, I know Germany does not have a skills list, but many countries do. Um, and if your program falls within your country's skills list, then you will be subject to 212E. The other common way that someone is subject to 212E is that they receive government funding, whether that's from their home country or from the US government for their program in the United States. So every J-1 visa holder has a document called a DS 2019. It's very similar to an I-20 for an F-1. And that DS 2019 has certain basic data on it about the nature of the program, the length of the program, uh, but on the bottom left hand corner of the DS 2019, the first time when your visa is issued, there's a little checkoff box that says you are subject to 212E or you are not subject to 212E. And then the consular officer who processed your visa application should sign it. So you want to review that. You want to review the annotation on if you have one on your J1 visa. Sometimes visas are annotated incorrectly. So it could be that your DS 2019 says that you are not subject, but your visa says that you are subject. I saw that yesterday in my office. Um, so you want to review those very, very carefully. If you think that there is an error that you are, that the consular officer thought you were subject and checked your DS-2019 or your visa says that you're subject, but you think in fact you are not subject, you can request an advisory letter from the U.S. Department of State 
There are very clear instructions on the U.S. Department of State's website about how to request the advisory letter. You can follow that and you can request an advisory letter and that will be basically an ultimate decision about whether you are subject or not. If you are in fact subject, you need to either complete two years at home before seeking an H-1B visa or a green card, permanent residence, or you have to seek a waiver of 212E. Uh, the most common, there are different forms of waiver. The most common waiver to receive is called a no objection waiver. And that's basically where your country says, look, we know that you, your program is on our skills list. Normally we would want you to come home and complete your two year residence requirement. But in your case, for whatever reason, we have decided that we have no objection to you not completing your two-year residence requirement. We do not need you to come home for two years at this point in time. Uh, that waiver is filed with the US, U.S. Department of State. The U.S. Department of State has a division called the Waiver Review Division. They have an online application process. It's fairly easy to use and very straightforward for this type of no objection waiver. You start the process with the U.S. Department of State. You'll be assigned a case number. You'll have to submit some basic information about why you're seeking a waiver, what kind of program you participated in, um, what you did during your program. Um, and then um, you will provide your case number to the relative authority within your home government. Sometimes that's the, uh, the consulate of your government um, in Washington, D.C. or in New York. Sometimes it's an office in your home country. Um, and they must write a letter directly to the U.S. Department of State Waiver Review Division confirming that they have no objection to you remaining in the United States and that they don't need you to go home. Um, once the Department of State has that letter from your country, they can complete processing. They will then forward your waiver to USCIS and USCIS should approve it um, and issue you approval notice. You need that approval notice in your hand before you apply for H-1B. So if you're applying for CAP subject H-1B particularly, uh, there are gonna be some timing issues. It can take many weeks to go through the no objection waiver process. Uh, if your country is slow to respond to your request, it can take many months. Um, I have seen a few take one to two years. Um, so this is something that you'll want to get on top of very quickly um, if you're able to. Um, if you are not able to obtain a no objection waiver, if your country really wants you to go home, or if you received government funding, either from your government or the U.S. government, you may not be eligible for a no objection waiver. There are other types of waivers available. Um, they include interested government agencies. So if you're looking at employment from a U.S. government agency, they can request a waiver on your behalf. Um, there's also um, an extreme hardship waiver. So if you are married to a U.S. citizen or have U.S. citizen children, you may be able to request an extreme hardship waiver. You, you know, for example, in pet clients who have children who require substantial medical care um, or a U.S. spouse who's involved in important work, which requires them not to leave the United States, um, you can ask for an extreme hardship waiver. I would just say um, they are not easy to win and require substantial documentation to win one. There's also a persecution waiver if you were to be persecuted if you return to your home country to do your two-year residence. Um, you could ask for a persecution waiver. This is similar to an asylum application and is also very difficult to win, but they are possible. Um, if you are a foreign medical graduate um, on a J-1 program, you can also seek a waiver. There are special uh, waivers for medical school graduates um, through the Conrad 30 program. 
I'm not going to go into that in, in any particular detail, but um, international student office um, may be able to point you in the right direction. And certainly um, there are private attorneys that handle those types of waivers as well. Yeah, so I think that's it. Tyler, do we have any questions about J1? J1 um, or waivers? We have some in general about a lot of different things, but um, I'll, I'll just let you uh, keep going and we'll, we'll probably just catch them in the Q&A. Sounds good. Thank you. So um, there are many different other types of non-immigrant visas to the United States, uh, more than just the H-1B, uh, more than just the H-1 so, uh, or the J-1. So I'm going to go through some of those now. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are the common visas that I see um, students and scholars um, use um, if they would like to remain in the United States. So the first one I'm going to talk about is an E3 visa. This is for citizens of Australia. It's very similar to the H-1B. It's for specialty occupations. Um, it does require a U.S. employer to, to sponsor you or petition for you. It is subject to a labor condition application and the prevailing wage or the wage requirement from the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, this type of visa can be filed on petition um, with USCIS inside the United States. You could, for example, change status from OPT or F1 to H1 or to E3 if you are an Australian national. Um, but also the U.S. consulates in Australia accept direct filing of these types of petitions. So that's a nice thing if you need to go home and take a break between the end of your studies and the beginning of your E3 employment, um, you can look at a direct consular filing. Different than the H-1B, which could be valid up to th three years, E2 is only valid for two years at any one filing. But it's a really good option. It's not subject to a cap. Um, I've seen very favorable adjudications by the U.S. consulates um, on these types of applications. Petitions that might have trouble with USCIS, for example, it's not clear that the job really requires a degree, or maybe my client does not have a full degree but is relying on some professional experience to qualify for the position. Sometimes those are good applications at a consulate and difficult applications with USCIS. Uh, there are also TN or trade NAFTA visas for citizens of Mexico and Canada. As long as your proposed employment is on the TN occupation list. So the TN occupation list is a list of occupations which were originally appended to the NAFTA treaty. Most of those occupations require a degree. Um, could be college professor, um, could be attorney, could be different medical professionals, geologists, engineers are very common TN occupations and that includes software engineer. There are two different ways again to apply for these. <coughs> One is through a consular filing if you are from Mexico or a border filing if you are from Canada or you can file a petition with USCIS to change status from F1 or OPT directly to the TN category. Um, TN from Mexico used to require a labor condition application, but they no longer do. So this is a really good classification if your, especially if your employer might not meet an H-1B wage requirement. Um, if you're from Canada, you know, filing at the border is fairly easy. Um, there are, right now under COVID, certain um, border checkpoints that are designated for these types of um, applications, including the major airports and then certain land ports of entry. Um, there will be skilled officers considering those. Um, if your degree is clearly listed as a qualifying degree for your proposed occupation, if your op proposed occupation clearly fits within the 
um, T and list of occupations. These are fairly straightforward, and relatively easy applications. So I would say the big downside of TNs compared to H1B is that TNs are not for people who are considering permanent residence. They really are considered to be non-immigrant um, visa petitions um, or, or visa categories. So it's for someone in, who intends to work in the United States for a period of time and then intends to return home. So it's easy to get TN for three years and maybe for six years, but past six years it's going to be very difficult. Um, there are O-1B visas for artists of extraordinary ability. Those are people who have been recognized as having distinction um, in their field. I have occasionally done O-1Bs for, um, for example, master's level musicians who are offered symphony positions or positions in um, musical groups that are well regarded. Um, those are very good. Um, petitions because you have a lot of flexibility in how you work. You could, for example, only work for your O-1B petition sponsor or your O-1B petition sponsor could be an agent that allows you to work in different locations. So for musicians in particular, it works very well if you're going to um, work with a variety of different organizations, lots of different gigs. You, you might want to look at an O-1B. It's much more flexible in terms of employment than an H-1B is. O-1As are for individuals of extraordinary ability. It could be in the sciences, business, engineering. Um, it really does require a high level of distinction, really um, national or international renowned. Um, not very many um, graduates are going to reach those standards, but you will have certain professors and scholars that probably reach that standard, or if you had significant recognition during your college career in your field or had um, experience in the field before um, coming to the U.S. to participate in your education, then uh, you may reach uh, a 1A status. Um, if you're closed out of the H-1B or don't qualify for a TN or E3, uh, we would certainly look at the O1B category. Um, E1s and E2s are for individuals from treaty countries. So not all countries have a treaty with the United States. Certain countries have a treaty. Um, most of the European countries, Canada, Mexico, um, several of the uh, countries in Asia will qualify. Um, China and India, unfortunately, do not have treaties. South Africa does not have a treaty. Um, but if you are a citizen of a treaty country um, and are entrepreneurial, this would be a good visa classification for you. So E2s are for owners or uh, owners or specialized knowledge employees of a company that's owned at least 50% by nationals of the country. Uh, the E2 business does need to make a substantial investment in the United States, which is probably at least a minimum of $100,000 invested, and it could be higher in some countries. And the U.S. company must employ other U.S. workers. It can't just be a company for the U E2 treaty visa holder. Um, it can be any kind of country, so I certainly file these for for many different kinds of companies, could be engineering firms, could be uh, real estate firms, could be uh, telecom firms, um, commonly can be restaurants, dry cleaners, liquor stores, really anything, um, as long as a legal business in the United States. And E1s are for people who conduct, who own a business that conducts substantial trade with the United States commonly importers or exporters um, of products from the country, um, but it could be an exchange of services. We're quickly running out of time, so I'm just going to quickly go into the permanent residence op uh, options. Um, there are many different classifications for obtaining permanent residence in the United States. The most common way to obtain permanent residence is through a family relationship. So being sponsored or petitioned by a U.S. citizen or permanent resident spouse or a U.S. citizen parent 
or a U.S. citizen child who's over the age of 21. About two thirds of all permanent residents or green card applications are through one of those bases. But there are very workable employment-based ways to ask for a green card. There are two ways that you can sponsor yourself for a green card. One is if your work is in the U.S. national interest through the National Interest Waiver Program. You must have either a master's degree or 10 years of experience to fit into that qualification. Um, but if you if your work is well recognized, if your position in the U.S. could not easily be filled, uh, this could be a good position for you or a good way for you to get a green card. Um, the extraordinary ability, which is the other way to self-petition for a green card, does require national or international renown, substantially strong evidence that you are one of the few at the very top of your field. So it's extremely high standard, but we do see it um, in the university context for sure. Um, there are ways that a university could sponsor outstanding professors and researchers. Um, and then the most common way that an, an employer sponsors an employee for a green card is through the PERM or labor certification process. That's where a company recruits or advertises for the position that shows that there are no qualified U.S. workers for the position. It's a very workable way to get a green card um, as long as you are not from China or India where uh, People from China and India may wait many years to go through that process, but it's worth getting in line. So you only get in line for a green card through the PERM or labor certification process by starting that process, by filing an application. Um, extensions of H-1B status will only be available um, past six years if your employer has started a perm for you or you filed a self-sponsored petition prior to the end of your fifth year in H-1B petition, in H-1B status. Um, extensions past six years are also possible if your I-140 is approved before the end of your sixth year. So there are very important timing considerations about how you combine an H-1B with the green card process. You can't wait to the very end of your H-1B eligibility to start the green card process. You've got to really start thinking about it no later than probably the beginning of your fourth year is where I would really start to strategize about that. Um, there's also a diversity lottery. So 50,000 green cards are available in most years um, to people who um, are from countries which historically have had low levels of immigration to the United States. That program is initially run by the U.S. Department of State. It's available every fall. So it's available now, for example. Um, the program was um, cut short this year by the Trump administration through some regulations. It has been reopened through some courts. Uh, it's not exactly clear what's going to happen next year. But if you apply now, you would be subject, you would, your application would be subject to a lottery. If you win that lottery, you will be notified sometime in May or June, probably, and would be able to file a green card the following October. So they're taking uh, lottery applications now um, that if selected would be able to file an application at the end of 2021 and into 2022. Um, it's a very politically vulnerable program, but it's not going to hurt you to try. Um, and I do every year handle some green card applications, usually for people who are selected in the lottery. So it does work for some folks. So I think I'm really at the end of my presentation. And um, you know, I would urge you to reach out to your International Student and Scholar Services Office. Um, we have two very um, thoughtful and knowledgeable professionals that can help guide you. Um, be careful what you read on the internet, it's not always correct. Uh, USCIS has a, a, a fairly robust, although I would say on the employment side, very incomplete website. Um, 
but it would get you started with some basic information. If you're looking at the J-1 program or the diversity visa program, definitely look at the U.S. Department of State website. Um, and then uh, Customs and Border Protection has some important information, especially if you're subject to any type of travel ban, if you need to travel um, during the time of COVID. Um, and of course, if you're looking for your I-94 and, and your current status, that's an important place to go to print off your I-94 every time that you enter the United States. So I'll leave it at that. Um, and then I think we have, you know, plenty of time now for, for Q&A. Yeah, we, we certainly do. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, you're welcome. So I'll, it seems like a, a decent amount of students. Uh, so I'll try and summarize the several questions we've got. Right. Great. About the H-1B timeline and the, and the green card application timeline. So several students asked, can a company apply for, or apply for H-1B for me? Like if I'm graduating in May 2021, for instance. Could they apply for me while I'm still a student? Um, several students wanted to know if a company could apply for them for green card while they're a student. And then after graduation, uh, they were wanting to know, can an employer apply for H-1B or green card while on OPT? And does H-1B have to be approved before an employer can apply for green card? So I know that was a lot, but that was just kind of timeline. Okay. On a timeline, so um, you do have to have received your degree or, or received a relevant degree before applying for the H-1B. So um, before a petition is filed with the Immigration Service, you must have completed your degree. So if you are going to graduate in May, for example, and your H-1B employer is CAP subject, you have to graduate and get that degree in hand before filing your petition. So if you are receiving your diploma on, well, if you've completed all your degree requirements, I should say, there's some case law about this, if you've completed all your degree requirements and the school can issue you a letter saying you've completed your degree requirements and you're just waiting for the graduation ceremony, um, so let's say you complete all your degree requirements on May 1st, but your graduation ceremony is not until May 15th. Anytime after May 1st, the company could file an H-1B for you. So you do have to actually complete your degree requirements before that H-1B petition is filed with the Immigration Service. How about a, a green card? Can, could a company file for somebody for a green card before they've graduated? Absolutely, but they couldn't require that degree as a, as a minimum requirement if the beneficiary didn't actually have it in hand. Um, so there's no legal requirement that someone be in H-1B status or actually in any particular non-immigrant status before the company files a firm application or labor certification or green card application. But if position, let's say the computer, position as a software engineer, and the employer would like to require that any applicant for the position have a bachelor's degree in computer science or related field, that means that the beneficiary actually has to have that bachelor's degree before the perm is filed with the Department of Labor. So the beneficiary has to qualify for the position as it's described in the perm application. But there's no, actually, there's no legal requirement that the beneficiary actually even be in the United States at the time that a perm is filed. And there are perms for positions that do not require a degree. So perm position in general has to be any position which requires two years of education or training. <coughs> but it doesn't have to be a position that requires a college degree. So if somebody, that leads into the other question, if a, a student or a graduate is on OPT, for instance, and they haven't yet been approved for H-1B or their company hasn't applied for them for H-1B, can their company just apply for them for a green card through employment outright while they're on OPT? They certainly can. And that's a strategy to consider, especially if you filed um, in the H-1B lottery and your petition filing was not selected in the lottery. 
your company could consider going directly to the green card process. There are just some timing considerations. So starting the green card process does not provide status to a student. It's just, they're just preliminary steps that need to be completed before you can get to the green card application. So there are two steps to that process. The first is the PERM with the Department of Labor, and the second is an I-140 petition with the Immigration Service. Neither of those steps are going to grant status. So the student needs to rely on the OPT um, during those two steps, and it can take more than a year to go through those two steps. I would say at the minimum, probably eight to 10 months to go through those two steps. And you would really have to be probably taking some risk and probably, you know, your company needs to be moving really fast. I don't, it just doesn't happen that often that we get to a status part of the process for at least a year. So maybe so, for such a person who doesn't have H1B, mainly it would probably be recommended that they have a STEM extension that's Absolutely. been approved. So they have that time yep. to be able to do a green card process. Exactly. And so, you know, it's, um, if you're not STEM eligible, it's a little difficult to push through the perm, but maybe you've made a relationship with an employer and you're comfortable with them. You made that relationship during CPT or otherwise. Um, but yeah, for someone in a STEM extension and you've got, 27 months of OPT, um, it, and if you're not selected in the H-1B lottery, then definitely I would talk to your employer about the possibility of going forward with the PERM or the green card process and not waiting around for the H-1B. And you could start the PERM process, for example, and still go back the following year if you're not completed with your PERM and reapply for the H-1B lottery. So, you know, for a lot of STEM students, you may have at least two chances to apply for the H-1B lottery. You know, your first year that you got your OPT and then your second year during your STEM extension. Um, so you know, hopefully you're selected in the lottery in one of those two um, opportunities. But if you're not, you could certainly move directly to the PERM application at any time. Um, one other question. It's sort of related, um, the balance between, and we actually have this question in our office sometimes, and we usually direct students to attorneys to discuss. Okay. If somebody has an OPT EAD card or a STEM extension EAD card, and down the line, they have it, they get an employment authorization document card through the I-45 I pending process, the green card pending process. Um, what are sort of conflicts between those EADs that would be good to consider and if, if someone has an I-485 EAD and they're still a student, they're looking to apply for OPT, what, what should maybe they be thinking about? Um, the four, well, I think you have to consider different scenarios. Um, if you have a 485 pending, you have to really evaluate how strong it is. If it's really strong, let's say it's a marriage-based petition or you have a, a child that's a US citizen child is over 21 um, and you feel really secure about your 485, the advantage of the EAD that's connected to your 485 is that that is open market work authorization. That means that you can work anywhere or not work as you please. If you want to work five hours a week, that's great. If you want to work 55 hours a week, that's great. If you want to, let's say you got a business degree, but what you really want to do is go work at a dance studio, you can use your 485 EAD to go do that. Your OPT is going to come with many more restrictions. So, and I'm sure you go over those with the, the students, but you know, you, the student will need an I-20 that's endorsed for that OPT. Um, the um, position that they accept on their OPT is going to have to be related to their education in certain ways. Um, so it's just gonna be more heavily regulated, the OPT, um, than an open market EAD. So, and you know, if as long as your OPT position is related to your degree and you know you're you're comfortable with that employer, um, you know you can go ahead and accept that. 
um, and then maybe you don't need an EAD. Um, but I would always encourage people to apply for the EAD connected to the 485 just because it will offer them far more options um, in terms of how they're employed and where um, and when and periods of unemployment would be covered where you know, in OPT, students have to be careful that they're not unemployed for more than a certain amount of time, et cetera. One of the next questions we have is, let's see. A one student asked, could you discuss um, immigration conflicts between EB2 and F1? Um, well, filing an EB2 petition, um, for most people, that's going to be in the national interest waiver category, I would assume. Um, it could be also an EB2 perm, um, but the EB2 perm, well, um, you know, for the PERM or the NIW, you may have to have completed a master's degree. But let's say you complete your master's degree and you're continuing on it with your PhD, so you're in F1 status. Usually you're starting, you know, you're gonna start your um, national interest waiver in the EB2 category by filing form I-140 immigrant petition. Um, in the PERM context, you're going to start with the Department of Labor, but if you win the Department of Labor section, then you're going to the I-140 immigrant petition. The immigrant petition in and of itself does not provide any status to the student, so the student would still be present in F1 status. The big conflict, I think, between an I-140 and F1 status is that an I-140 is evidence of immigrant intent. It's evidence that the student wants to stay in the United States permanently. The F1 student is a non-immigrant status, and it requires someone to be able to tell a consular officer, I'm, tending, I'm coming to the United States to complete my studies, but then my intention is to return home when my course of study has ended. Um, and the I-140 is in conflict with that non-immigrant intent. So I think if you're going to file an I-140, you have to really consider your travel plans carefully. You have to consider the consulate where you might be applying for a visa. So there might not be a strong need to show non-immigrant intent if you are from an EU country, for example, but if you are from a country outside the EU, outside of Canada, you may need to show non-immigrant intent in order to receive another F1 visa. So you'll have to consider your travel plans very carefully. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure specifically, uh, I think that you admit, a student is asking, what is the significant participation in your own company for H1B purposes? I think they may be getting at the connection between the, the employee-employer relationship, maybe? Yeah, I'm not sure what significant participation means, but for the H-1B, I would say you do have to have an employer-employee relationship between the H-1B beneficiary and the petitioner. Um, and that, you know, that means that the employer has to employ you in the position that's described in the petition, paying you W-2 wages, you cannot be paid as a contractor. Your W-2 wages need to meet or exceed the prevailing wage. You can't rely on commissions or bonuses in order to do that since those are, those could come to you and those might not come to you. Um, so you have to maintain that employer-employee relationship in order to maintain H-1B status. I think that is probably a pretty good response. Okay. Uh, not while well, they can ask a follow-up question. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think that was Andre. So Andre, if you want to follow up, let us know if that didn't answer your question. Um, this last person, uh, this is the last question we have on deck for now, and perhaps we'll have some other ones. Uh, we have about 11 minutes, everybody, if, if anybody else wants to pose some questions. Um, but this person asked, what is an example EB1 checklist? For example, X number of publications, X number of conferences, and they said they realize um, recognition can be a little subjective depending on the field. That's what they're getting at. Um, 
very subjective and depending on the officer. So some officers require really high showings um, in order to win these cases, and some officers are going to consider more the whole picture. But for the EB1A criteria, the extraordinary ability criteria, there are I think 10 different options and you can read those on the USCIS website. And you must show that you meet three of the criteria. So the criteria are quite variable. It could include publications or scholarly um, research, but it doesn't have to. Um, so they're, they're, the criteria are written fairly general, so that generally, so they could cover a variety of occupations. Um, you know, I certainly file EB1As, for example, for dancers and athletes. And so they're not going to have any scholarly publications, um, but they may have participated in um, significant um, performances that were highly recognized or critically reviewed in a very positive way. Um, or they may be athletes who are, you know, have a high rank and they may have set a uh, the record in their country, they may have set a world record, they may have competed in the Olympics, they may have participated in the Tour de France, it, you know, it just depends on their field. So it, it really is subjective depending on where your field of expertise is. It's helpful in an EB1 category to narrow the field of expertise to show that, you know, you are an expert in a particular narrow um, aspect, like, you know, you can't be an expert in physics, for example, you have to be an expert in, you know, a particular type of analysis within physics. Um, so, you know, but when you're looking at science, sciences, the sciences and people who do have scholarly publications, USCIS will look at your Google Scholar rating ranking and they want to see something very impressive, something very high. So if your publications, for example, were published very recently um, and your Google Scholar rating is rather low because, you know, people haven't had a chance to really um, absorb your research or to use it in their own research, then that's probably not a good time to file an EB1 petition. You want to let those numbers percolate. You want to get your numbers up in probably in the hundreds um, for a Google Scholar rating. So, um, you know, this is something that is really particular to each person's um, situation and really something that would need to be carefully evaluated, whether it's, um, you know, through your office, Tyler, or, or through an immigration lawyer. Of course, yeah. Well, that, I think that's really helpful. It looks like we just had another question pop up, or okay. several, actually. Let's see. Just one moment. Sure. Okay. So um, Mon is asking, can I still apply for F1 OPT or other F1 benefits if I have filed form I-485 or am showing immigration intent, assuming that I will remain in the US? So they're a current student looking at applying for OPT and, uh, or I guess STEM maybe in the future, and they already have an I-485 pending. From just an immigration lawyer's point of view, yes, you can do that. There's nothing prohibiting that in the law. You know, you're, I don't know if your office, Tyler, has any particular limits in issuing another I-20 when you're aware that a 485 is pending. We, we do not. Um, that's uh, that's not really part of our metric that we look at. It's more about have they met all the other OPT requirements that we discussed yeah. with them. Yeah. So I do encourage my clients who have 45 spending to go ahead and get that F1 OPT going, just in case something happens to the 45, or um, just because oftentimes the um, F1 OPT will be issued more quickly than the 45 EAD. So 45 EADs at this point in time, uh, for many reasons, are taking sometimes six to eight months to receive, and the F1 OPT will come more quickly. So another,
student is asking, um, do positions either on OPT or H1B, the person is saying help compound or recognize status. I think what they're getting at is if you're with maybe the same employer or with similar employers, does that put you in a, a in prior statuses? Does that help you succeed later on in like an EB2 or an EB1, for instance? Yes, usually, usually. Um, and it'll help you in the perm context, for example, because <laughs> most perm positions are going and, you know, for white collar workers are going to require a degree plus a certain number of years of experience. Um, and so, you having that certain number of years of experience with a different employer before filing the perm application makes for a stronger perm application. Um, for the MIW, um, they're not often going to be granted to people who are recent graduates. Same with the EB1. The EB1 criteria specifically says that you need significant recognition over time. So having experience is a good thing. You can earn earn you know your gray hairs. So <laughs> right. it will benefit you. Yeah. Um, so the last question we seem to have on deck for the time being is: Will a transfer from H one B to F one, then to H one B again status, have an impact for future immigration applications, or any difficulties or issues? So I suppose they're asking going from an uh, immigrant intent to non-immigrant intent and back again, and what the implications of that might be for future sure. benefits. And I, I do have people do that. So some people might get an H-1B um, after completing a bachelor's degree, work at that for a few years, decide they want to go back for a master's, transfer back to F-1, complete the master's and, and the OPT associated with the master's, and then go back to H-1B. So it does happen. Um, I don't see per particular problems with that kind of scenario. Um, H-1B is dual intent. Someone on an H-1B could be someone with non-immigrant intent, meaning that they're going to go home at the end of their stay, or they could be someone with immigrant intent. It could be either one. It's not really questioned in the H-1B context. Um, to get an F-1 visa, you do have to show non-immigrant intent. Um, so depending on your circumstances, that could be just a statement from you. Yes, I'll go home when I'm required to do that. Um, or it may, or a consular officer may require additional documentation to show that you intend to return home at the end of your stay. Depends a little bit on what country you're from um, and your personal circumstances. Um, would need to be evaluated. So the more ties that you have to a foreign country, for example, your family is still there, your family has good ties in terms of business, home, um, status in the community, um, those kinds of things are, are going to uh, make an F-1 visa application easier um, than, than if you don't have those things. Right, thank you, Lisa. So, um, one person asked how do they get in contact uh, with you if they wanted to and her email address is uh, actually or I think it's right there or did, I think we emailed yes, so the website address is right here batnalper.com you can do contact me off of that um, or yeah. we had before our presentation um, we had provided an email address to, to reach out to your firm as well that you would give okay. us Lisa so um, whomever this is, if you look back in the email we sent advertising about this, you can find Lisa's contact information there or like she mentioned, off of her website to get in contact. Um, it looks like the last question we'll have time for is um, how many people, many people are now changing from EB2 to EB3 because of the change in priority dates. How relevant is it to do this and what issues might one have if they change their category during the immigration immigration purpose i'm not sure what they mean by that well it's a very hot topic especially for people from india so um for people from other countries it's not particularly relevant to downgrade from eb2 to eb3 but if you're from india you may want to do a downgrade from eb2 to eb3 depending on what your priority date is um, 
there would have to be a number of factors assessed before determining whether downgrading would be valuable for you. But um, including your educational background, the occupation being, or the position being still available to you, but your company could file a new I-140 in the EB-3 category. It's not amending the prior petition, it's an additional petition. So assuming that your position qualifies both in the EB-2 category and the EB-3 category after EB-2 approval, you could, for example, file another I-140 in the EB-3 category, recapture the priority date from the EB-2 classification, um, and move forward to a green card quickly. Okay. This is this has really only become uh, an issue um, following October 1st. October 1st of this year was the first time this has happened in my memory, and I've been practicing immigration law for 25 years now. So um, it's very novel, uh, but it is possible. So um, it's something that you, you should consult an immigration attorney about or your ISS S office if that's something you want to consider. Right, and they, they were just a, sort of a follow-up was, they were saying, why is an EB-3 a, a downgrade? Uh, what does downgrading mean and entail is what they were. Oh, so the EB-3 uh, category is for people who have at least um, two years of education and experience. Um, and it would include people who have a bachelor's degree and less than five years of experience. To get into the EB-2 category for PERM, you must have either a master's degree or greater, or a bachelor's degree plus five years of experience. So it's just a higher educational requirement to slip into the EB-2 category um, and a lower educational requirement to get into the EB-3 category. But if you are able to receive a green card, the green card is the same for everybody. So use whatever's available. And if you have multiple, if you ch have chances to have multiple petitions out there, I you know I say you know it takes time and it takes money, but it, the more opportunities you have, the more options you have to eventually receive your green card. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions we have, Lisa. Thank you so much for your time. We all really appreciate you joining us. It's been very informative. Um, so we have uh, one more uh, announcement. We did we did provide Lisa's contact information again. Her website is batonalpert.com. Uh, I did want to follow up with one other item, uh, so I'll share my screen here. So th there's actually going to be a United States election system talk, another webinar that you might be interested in if you're wanting to follow what's going on with U.S. politics right now. That'll be, um, the registration website is here. If you need to follow up with us later to get that information, it's going to be from 5 to 6 p.m. on October the 27th. And then uh, I wanted to mention that we'll have another webinar session. It's more or less going to be covering very similar content with another immigration attorney on November the 10th from 12 to 1.30. Uh, the registration would be the same place you found uh, the first one when we emailed that out. It's also available on our website. And uh, here's that uh, other one once more. Get that up there. Uh, so I just wanted to say thanks again one more time to Lisa. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. My pleasure, really. Thank you for, for inviting me. Of course, and Anne is also um, on the ISSS uh, team. Hi, so. Anne. Nice to meet you. <laughs> thank yes, you, Susan. Anna. Nice to meet you, too. <laughs> For your All right, well, th thanks, everybody. Um, if you want to follow up with uh, any of the ISSS team or Lisa, feel free to. And otherwise, uh, hope you have a great rest of your week. Take care. Have a good day, Thank everybody. Bye. Bye.